I live to see you eat that contract. But I hope you leave enough room for my fist because I'm going to ram it into your stomach and break your goddamn spine! Ah! You've joined the Beatty Max Video Club, rewinding back to our favourite films of the 1980s. My name's Rich Nelson, and tonight I've rented The Running Man. Watching it with me is James Montague, author, journalist, and once described as the Indiana Jones of soccer writing. Hi James, how are you? I'm alright, thank you very much, thanks for having me on. It's, 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 it's amazing to, to be not talking about football for once. <laughs> I say, um, that's kind of how we know each other, but this was one of the films that early doors we got talking about on Twitter. Um, how was it re-watching for you this time around? Well, I mean, watching it back, I mean, I've always loved uh, The Running Man because it has this, obviously, this game show quality, which you could kind of feel coming through, even in the kind of late 80s, early 90s when I was watching it. You know, you, you could feel the kind of influence of American game show television. And it, it seems to be so prophetic now, you know, looking looking back at it, like, what it, what it was saying, what it was doing. And if, if you've, anyone's watched any of Black Mirror, there's a lot of, you know, you can see, you can see that Charlie Brooke has watched this. Um, and there was another thing, was that I remember on, on the Super Nintendo, they had Smash TV, yeah. which was kind of a mixture of, um, it was like a top-down shoot up It was kind of a mixture of the running man meets kind of, I buy this for a dollar guy from Robocop. Uh, so, <laughs> so I loved, I mean, I, I loved this film and I was generally at that period of my life and I was very young, but, um, I had older friends and we were obsessed with Arnold Schwarzenegger films and he seemed to have every single one of them on VHS, not Beat Max, unfortunately. Uh, we had all of them on VHS. So even though I was far too young, to watch any of these films. I mean, I remember I went to watch Gremlins 2 on my 11th birthday, I think. It might, I think it was on my 12th birthday. That's sick. Uh, but it was the day before my 12th birthday. And I was honest at the cinema when they asked my age and they wouldn't let me in. So I was heartbroken. I couldn't go watch Gremlins 2 on my birthday. And so we went back home and we picked up Raw Deal from the, from the, record, from the, um, from the video shop and watched that instead. So that was, it was either, either kids movies or <laughs> hyper violent Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. Well, funny, this is episode six. Um, it's already the second Schwarzenegger film we've done after Commando and, um, the second mention for Raw Deal as well. So, uh, at least you're a bit more complimentary about it than Terry was about. Well, Raw Deal isn't a great film and Commando, I mean, it just, um, you know, I just, I think Commando probably has Arnie, one of Arnie's top five best lines, which is, you know, he's dead tired, yeah. you know, when he snaps that guy's neck, <laughs> you know, as he, as he jumps off, off the back of the plane, he's just, it's just, uh, it's just genius. This is sort of two years later, but it's, it's very much at the peak of Schwarzenegger's fame, really. He's off the back of Terminator. He's sort of churning these films out at a tremendous rate. And this, sort of one of the lesser known facts, was actually based on a Stephen King short story. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's more of a short story, really. And, and uh, reading it, as I've, I've done recently, or most of it, I haven't got around through it all, but I mean, Ben Richards is a very different character. Mm. Um, you know, he's a struggling father whose daughter's sick. And, you know, there's, you know, it's, it's a dystopian future, 2025. And... You know, the haves and the have nots, the only way to get up and uh, to get anywhere in this, there's even different money for the rich and the poor. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to make bridge that gap, it, you know, you go to the games division where there are all sorts of uh, different games. One of them, which I read, which didn't make it, was getting sick people with heart defects to, um, and, or, or kind of, you know, high blood pressure to go on a treadmill and answer questions in the specialist subject. And every time they got a question wrong, they'd speed up the, speed up the, the treadmill. Uh, a whole a heart. Mastermind, <laughs> well, I mean, well, I mean, you know, I mean, it would, it would, it would jazz it up. I think if mastermind <laughs> added a treadmill and a yeah. almost certain death element to it, but um, it, yeah, so it is, it's a Stephen King, uh, Stephen King book and, uh, and, and it deals with some, you know, very important themes, you know, this, 
idea of uh, corporations owning the future and this game showification uh, of society. And, and, you know, one of the things I think picking up, which I, maybe didn't go over my head, but certainly stuck out this time when I was watching it back was, and so Gillian sees Ben Richards in action, sees this kind of hunk of man escaping from, you know, in, in slow motion, very kind of homoerotic almost scene of him kind of leaping over mounds, um, this kind of little beard that he has on. There's not many films that he's got a beard on. I, think, I remember Schwarzenegger, I think he might have a beard as a disguise in True Lies. Yeah. And he has one at the beginning of Commando when he's carrying the log, I think. But yeah, not often the beard comes out. Uh, and, you know, one of the things he says, yeah, you know, get me the Justice Department. Uh, no, get me the president's agent. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because, I mean, of course, the, the current president of the United States of America does yeah. have an agent, probably, or did at least, you know. Yeah. Um, and then rather than an attorney, when he is going down into the running man uh, arena, he, he's given a court-appointed agent who, <laughs> who, you know, I think one of the funniest parts of the film was when he uh, signs the contract on his back and then jams, the, <laughs> stabs him in the back with the pen. That's uh, so, not this, yeah. yeah, there's all there's all sorts of uh, really funny. I mean, because Running Man's a little bit of kind of it, it is a favourite with Schwarzenegger fans, but it isn't a particularly popular film. You know, um, it's seen as a little bit. I think that might be to do with the ending, but I mean, we'll talk about that later. But it, it's uh, you know, it's, in, it's it's for me, it's a it's a great slice of dystopic kind of. Well, yeah, it's it sort of reminds me of that sort of satire style, the, the elements of like we talked about Robocop already or Total Recall, which were both sort of the Hoven films, but um, that sort of era of the 80s when people were starting to look at capitalism and, and that way of life as worthy of taking the mick out of. And, I mean, even the opening crawl of the film, you know, and, and as I said, I haven't read the book. It's one of these things that I've been meaning to do. And, and as you say, it is based on the short story, but, but the, there are supposed to be large differences, but I'll, I'll read out the opening part anyway. It says, by 2017, the world economy has collapsed. Food, natural resources and oil are in short supply. A police state divided into paramilitary zones rules with an iron hand. Now, we're in 2017 now. Huge parts of that statement are, we can't argue, are, are pretty much true. Um, yeah. You've been all over the world for your day job. Um how far do you think we are from an actual game show where this sort of thing is, is glamorised? Well, um, I don't think we're that far off. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, having caught appointed agents, we probably, we are quite, we can't quite far off that. Um, you know, especially with Hoven, uh, and this taps into it, you can see with the use of kind of adverts, mm. you know, to, to show how, and uh, like news events that you can occasionally kind of pop into billboards and stuff, which show kind of very different kind of future. Um, you know, he, they, he was, Hoven especially, if you look at Robocop, um, Total so Recall, were, was obsessed with this idea of corp- corporations and companies uh, taking over uh, the public space, cut the public sphere. And in Robocop, it is, you know, the police, which is the ultimate, uh, you know, cops don't strike. You know, that's, um, you know, the, the captain's telling the cops, but they've had enough because they're getting beaten in the field um, yeah. by Emil and his crew, you know. Um, and, you know, when you look back at Robocop, it's almost, it's gone past that. The idea of private security forces, the privatisation of, of police forces, um, even in, I mean, Finland, the country that you know very well, I mean, has got, you know, for, for a very liberal country has, has got a huge issue when it comes to, um, how much, how many kind of security contracts, central security contracts are kind of awarded to, um, to private contractors. And yeah. we can see this with kind of Blackwater. We can see this with the kind of the military in the United Arab Emirates and in, you know, the, the, these essentially kind of mercenary, armies that are fighting when you think of what's happening in yemen a lot of that is mercenary armies taking taking that on and private contractors so this is all something uh, that is has really it, it, like we said it's prophetic rather than predictive mm. and whilst there isn't a game show uh that currently sends prisoners into you know uh, into these kind of fight or flight uh, escape or death kind of scenarios 
if you check the projection, you know, it, it, that's where we're going is greater humiliation and greater sacrifice. Yeah. Um, and also for a lot of people, which is in the book more than in the film, for many people, the only opportunity. And, you know, if we think of White Bear, the, the Black Mirror episode, which uh, isn't quite a game show as such, it's more just entertainment. But, you know, you can you can tell that heavily borrows from The Running Man. And, um, it, 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 you know, this idea of, you know, the, the kind of stocks, uh, of the 21st century and that being, uh, being reality television in the game show format, I think is, I think is, is, is very prophetic. Yeah. I mean, that was a sort of particularly stark episode of Black Mirror, not that they were, they were light in their own way. Um, I'll say this. The film also heavily influenced The Hunger Games, which is far more popular. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, the film opens, well, the opening scene was Schwarzenegger is a police helicopter pilot uh, running the rule over what he describes as a food riot in progress in the middle of Bakersfield, California. 1,500 people basically fighting over food, which, again, while probably in 1987, it, it may have seemed somewhat outlandish, you know, it's not a million miles away from what we see now, um, you know, in a sort of Mad Max dystopian future style. And yet, you know, he, the police, and it's a fairly, fairly heavily armoured helicopter flying over this riot, yeah. and he's given orders to shoot them, shoot on sight. And it gives us an early insight into his character that he's saying they just want some food for God's sake, and, you know, he refuses to fire. And yet this, you assume his boss back at base is telling him and if not him then someone else on the helicopter to open fire on all these people who are just trying yeah. to get food the fact that he puts up a pretty good fight and while he nearly fell, falls out of the helicopter in the melee the fact that later on we learned that 60 people have died during this when they've edited the footage and, and made it look like he did it himself so they must have taken him into custody on the helicopter and then continued the mission and killed 60 people, which despite someone putting up fairly you know, strong protest and it's Schwarzenegger, it's the star of the film. Um, you know, they've, they've, yeah, I mean, I was watching this uh, again and it really struck me this kind of moralistic tone that, that Schwarzenegger takes in the or Ben Richards takes in the beginning, because obviously it's such a, uh, ruined and militaristic and cruel society that they they exist in that why why is this the moment where he decides to kind of st not you know you can imagine that this is this is like bread and butter for the yeah. police you know bre there must be bread riots going over all over the place so in a way that was because that wasn't particularly believable um for me but what was i think a really interesting element of this is that later on when he goes down into the in the running man game they play a video of the bakersfield uh, massacre and of course they've completely edited it to make him look as if it was him that ordered and killed everybody uh, and later on you see this at the end of the film when jesse ventura the second governor <laughs> of the u.s state uh, you know US, u.s governor to come into this into this film um he you know, they, they use kind of mapping technology to make it look like he snaps Maria Conchita Alonso's neck uh, and obviously then impales Arnold Schwarzenegger. And this is something that I think is, is, a, is a theme throughout the film, which is about what, what's the truth and how you can uh, manipulate the truth and propaganda. And the, the main problem, I, I mean, I love the film, and the main problem I've got is that the end is that the idea that if you show people the truth on television... It, you know, the scales will fall from their eyes and they will believe what they see and suddenly they'll see the truth and realise that this is, the, uh, this is the uprising. They need to kind of throw off the shackles of this uh, brutal regime. But as we've seen in the Trump era uh, and uh, to a lesser extent, but for us, no less important, uh, the Brexit era, you know, what, what is true and what is not and what people are willing to accept, you know, often if you, if, you know, I can imagine that in, in this day and age, if you, saw, if you showed people the truth, they would they would choose not to believe it because you know I always believe believe that you know you can choose you can, you can you can believe what you like but you can't choose your facts. Um, but in this kind of post fact world, that's you know that 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 isn't the case. And one of the you know the big things. I mean, I'm in Serbia right now. We just had the the verdict in the Hague for the Mladic 
uh, Radcliffe Mladic trial, and he's the guy who who's been found guilty of genocide in Srebrenica and of awful crimes against humanity. But here, people see a lot of people see him as a hero because there is a there is a different narrative and a different history, and it doesn't matter like if you show people a video of something he did, they'd say it was faked because they'd already made their mind up what the truth is, and that I think that is that's the fundamental flaw with the film, I think. But that's because I think that, that we've become much more cynical i think you know i think maybe maybe in 1987 the idea that you could have a kind of moment where where you could show the truth and that could change things like a watergate moment almost um and we see that with the american president at the moment with this drip drip effect there's there's nothing that seems to stick because you know there is no there is no dagger in the heart anymore and there is no single element that can do it like you, you, you're thinking if he can survive grab your pussy video and still get elected if he can survive multiple issues about collusion with his team and the uh, Russian yeah. government and agents within it and so yeah it, it's in a way although it's set in 2017 and it appears to be far in the future in terms of a western society being under the heel of a fascist dictatorship like that some of the themes is it's almost naive we could have gone past it it's got worse than that you sort of hope this would be the birth of fake news or something like that. It's uh, like you say that everything's presented for effect. We've got the scene where Schwarzenegger and his chums escape from prison. The very infamous yeah. the neck collars, and the next scene is them going to meet the resistance, and they're basically favelas in the suburbs of Los Angeles. You know, this is again just showing this is the haves and the have-nots, where Mick Fleetwood is the leader of the resistance. I, I, I've got a lot to say about Mick Fleetwood. Yeah, he's um, the the Brits 89 famous video of, of him hosting with Samantha Fox. Was on. There was a clip of that on the telly last night, and to be fair, that made him look like an Oscar winner in this film. So, I mean, I, I think he's I think he's great in, in this film. I think he... he and what is... There's a, there's a great Reddit thread about this, uh, which you could find if you put in Mick Fleetwood running man in, into google you'll find it and i think it's right i think he plays himself yeah. he plays himself because he talks about he has his monologue in the beginning when he meets ben richards and um he's there to take the neck collar off him after he's escaped and so he's taking it off and he says you know you you're you're part of the system you banned my songs you know so i think he plays himself in the future yeah. Um, which is weird because he's got more hair in the future. <laughs> so maybe they predicted like really successful hair grafts as well. I mean, who knows? But, you know, bear in mind that, you know, I think of Mick Fleetwood. I mean, a lot of people, you know, I'm now getting to the late 30s. I didn't grow up with Flint, uh, uh, with Fleetwood Mac, sorry. Um, but, you know, for my parents' generation, you know, they're, they're this glamorous, drug-taking kind of rock and roll band that all fucked each other. Uh, for us, you know, I can I think of him with Sam Fox uh, <laughs> at the Brit Awards with the worst single piece of television ever. And so when I looked, I, you know, I thought Mick Fleetwood looked back in some of his, uh, you know, acting career. And I, I went into um, IMDb and found that he was in a TV show called Wise Guys, which was this very popular US kind of, I guess, a kind of cop show. But it was kind of a financial crimes show. And there's there's a season where they end up in... Uh, the record industry, uh, looking at kind of people who are, and it's it's you've got uh, you've got some cracking guys in there. You've got the guy who plays Emil, uh, the guy who gets melted in RoboCop. Uh, you know, help me, I'm melting. Uh, he's he's in there as a uh, as a as a record producer. You've got Debbie Harry is in there. She's got a main role. Uh, you've got Mick Fleetwood as this kind of burnt out English rocker who's who signs a deal with this with this guy to for like a pastrami sandwich, and in that he's genuinely one of the worst people I've ever seen act. I mean, I mean, it is awful. Um, and bearing in mind that that's I think it's a year later. You know, he puts in a pretty passable performance. I mean, he's got a great line as well. Like in the second part, when the kind of uprising is taking place, he goes, "You know, Mr. Spock, you've got the comms." To to he's number two, and he's like, "Who's, who's Mr. Spock?" Because <laughs> you know, he's too young to understand this kind of reference to some kind of old fogies uh, cultural totem. Um, so I think, I mean, either he took lessons, or but I mean, after that, he's he's nowhere. You know, and this and this is. Mick Fleetwood, I think, I mean, it's not an Oscar performance, but I think it's a really good performance. 
Um, but then, I mean, really, although Arnie is the star of the show, uh, Richard Dawson is the real Brilliant. star of the show. He is the guy that steals. And this is, I mean, not a lot of people know this, but he's a British actor um, and uh, kind of game show host. Went to America, uh, was the first and probably most iconic in American culture kind of host of Family Fortune, which they call Family Feud over there. Um, and he had a very minimal acting career uh, later in life. He was known as a as a as a as a kind of game show host. I mean, he, he started. He, he had some acting roles in The Outer Limits back in the day. Very cool. Uh, we're looking back at it now, but really settled into this in later in life and did this incredible act of essentially a pastiche of himself. You know, of of what he would become as a bastardized version in the future. Uh, and for me, Richard. Dawson really steals the show of this film, you know. Um, I don't know who won the Best Actor in 1987 for the Oscars, but or, or Supporting Actor, but I'm, he, I, I'm assuming he didn't get nominated. But I mean, it's, it's such a good, it's just, it's just absolutely believable, wonderful, uh, wonderful performance. And I think he had one film, film uh, credit after that, and that was it. I mean, the thing is, is like you say, he presented Family Feud and. I suppose in a weird way, it's like the equivalent of Les Dennis hosting something similar here. It's just such a... Yeah, I mean, imagine imagine having this topic future... Uh, I mean, it would be... I mean, I could, I could actually, now that I think about it, I could probably see a Black Mirror episode where Les Dawson plays this kind of, like, kind of evil running man style, Killian style character... <laughs> I mean, or at least being cast in that, and then you'd have to be surprised by his kind of grit and his and his uh, ability to show a very dark side, which you've got to remember that when before, you know, for the majority of the American public in 1987, this guy was a wholesome, uh, very hands-on uh, host of Family Feud. Because one of the big things was he would kiss everybody when he came yeah. on, which then became a bit kind of, it was a bit... Yes. A, a little bit too intrusive. <laughs> so... <laughs> In, in the current climate, with the uh, some, some of the unwanted attention from Hollywood, it's uh, perhaps well, in keeping. Even yeah. then, even in the eighties, it became uh, an issue. So uh, that's how hands on it was. Yeah. But, but you know, he pulls it out of the bag with this kind of chain smoking, um, like it, I, I, you know, incredible performance. And I, I, I'm trying to think of, of films in you know Arnie films of the eighties, and there's some uh, and nineties, and there's some great great performances. Um, thinking of a better one, I think maybe in all those films, maybe, I think maybe Richard Dawson might be the best. I think maybe um, Michael Biehn in 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 Terminator, yeah. potentially. Um, but in terms of kind of like supporting actors, you know, that, that was he he really stole the show. He did, and again, sometimes in, in a Schwarzenegger film where Schwarzenegger almost he wouldn't say he's even acting, he's playing a very similar role. He's the action hero of a few throwaway quotes and murdering everyone left, right, and centre. Um, but Dawson, as Killian, he is the show. He, as you said earlier, he sees Richard escaping from prison, demands him on the show, pulling his strings for the Justice Department and that. And he also blackmails Richard into doing the show because when he's captured, the yeah. two sort of his two accomplices in the escape, uh, he's ca- he's sort of kidnapped them as well and the idea of getting Richards and coercing him into doing the show, because essentially this is a show for entertainment where gladiators or the stalkers, as they're called, hunt down fugitives or criminals and and try and kill them. And one of the prizes they mention that people can win is trial by jury, which is just, again, crazy to me that that is a prize. It just shows the idea that if you want a fair trial, you've got to escape death from these professional assassins. It's, um, you know, it, the, the idea that this is not a right anymore, it's something that you have to buy, is is another another theme, I think, that is, again, prophetic and predictive at the same time. You know, because we, we're having this with legal aid, with the, as the state is being rolled back, you know, really everywhere. And if you think of the rise of, kind of the nationalist right across Europe and um, what's happening in the US and especially in the UK. These are things that are kind of the things that even when you're writing these films, even when they were writing these films in the 80s, these, I mean, a lot of it, there was a lot of kind of 
if you think of like 70s and 80s sci-fi, there was a lot of this kind of overpopulation, food collapse, almost environmental sci-fi. I mean, if you think of a film like Soylent Green, for instance, which I think is probably the the king of that genre. But this kind of touches on it, this kind of, like this, this, you know, that it's almost the, the society collapses under its own weight, in a way. If, in, looking back at it, analysing this <laughs> film, rather than watching it, I found it quite depressing. <laughs> and even little things like, um, we've sort of skirted around how Schwarzenegger meets Amber, who lives in his brother's old apartment. And how she, you know, he tries to yeah. escape and, and go away, and she dumps him in basically to the airport police. And it's clearly a pre nine eleven airport where they can get through just by asking the security guard to hold some underwear. You know, this is the part when, by the time Richards has been coerced into doing the show, he's being led down the corridor by his court appointed agent Amber, who works for ICS doing the jingles. So she's sort of lurking around the studio, and her friend's trying to buy a can of cola for six dollars yeah the fact it's a six dollar can of cola can of, yeah it, it, it there's these little these little lines like the fact that his brother's been sent away for re-education um you know they, they, just, they just drop in there and and not you know they're not explained there's no exposition for that you know uh which i which i loved i mean it's it, it was for me that was that was one of the best parts of the film and even little things where they sort of make eye contact in the hallway he clearly has an unforgiving look and has friends give the very odd sort of line as it says um lucky he didn't kill you or rape you didn't kill you or kill you <laughs> and that's just you know again for yes this was an 18 and yes this was a, a incredibly violent film but even hearing a line like that in a film now we kind of think bloody hell that's a bit I mean, they, they turn him into a kind of strange sex kind of yeah. figure in this film and, and other films as well. I mean, the opening of Commando is a prime example yeah. where you, they want to show show his absolute beefcakeness off. Um, whereas he, I, I don't know, I, I, I never really, I never saw him as something, someone to, even though I loved Schwarzenegger, I never thought, yeah, I want to look like that. I want to get buff like that, and it wasn't. It didn't seem to be. He seemed to almost be asexual in a way. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they really tried hard to make it like women. Like, I mean, actually, one of my favourite lines, which I still use occasionally with my sister, who also <laughs> loves these films, uh, is when he ta- he's, he's he's dressed. And also, I think probably his best line because one of the things that that starts coming out in this kind of period of Schwarzenegger's career is that he starts kind of. Of course, he's got he's got his own lines that he adds, his own little one liners. Uh, this comes out the same year as yes. Predator, which is full of them. Um, I'll be back is already something that's kind of started to come seep into the public consciousness. Um, and so he has these kind of like comedic lines all, all running up to true lies, which is brilliantly funny. And he's absolutely brilliant. There. In this film, it's a bit hit and miss, but the, the two that I found really funny was when he's frog marching Amber up to the kind of security dressed in like a terrible, uh, secu- like a Hawaiian shirt and says, remember I can snap your neck like a chicken's. <laughs> Which for some reason I have remembered for like twenty five years. Like it's just a brilliant line. And uh, and then he gets through, she goes, I, I get see I get sick, I get seasick, I get air sick, I'll vomit all over you and you could go ahead on this shirt, you won't notice. <laughs> Which is you know, and there's a couple of others like that are terrible, like when he kills Sub Zero, he says, You he was Sub Zero, now he's nothing zero or something like that like some like awful kind of like ah, that cringy line but you can see that this is the this is the start of it you know him being kind of groomed for kindergarten cop and you know twins and all that kind of stuff yeah. it's strange how you know no matter how many rewrites or, or what it takes they did that that sub-zero now plane zero line clearly made it through to the final cut it's uh it does seem incredibly forced and you know, we've already had because this is the point now where we've we've started the game. He's been sent on his little car into what used to be uh, West Los Angeles after an earthquake in 1997, and he's uh, already said to Killian, "I'll be back." This is you know, he's got it in early, and Killian, you know, admittedly confused first, has then said, "Only in a rerun." So at least he's had a. Come back to that. It's great. Can you think of a single person that has outshone Schwarzenegger in an "I'll be back" moment? I can't because I think that's the only time where somebody has an answer that beats him. I think we let's say in the episode we did Commando, and 
he said, I'll be back Bennett to the guy who looked like Freddie Mercury. Yeah. And he just said something in a very high pitched Aussie. Sort of, I'll be ready, John. <laughs> um, Terry, Terry, who was the guest, he did a much better impression, but, um, that was it. That was, I think, the only comeback. Yeah, that's terrible. I mean, that high pitch. I mean, and, and in the end, he gets him with, you know, let off, yeah, I think, let off some steam when he puts the pipe through him. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. I love that film. Um, so we've started the game, and of course, you know, it's a dystopian future, but it's, a, it's still a game show. We've still got the show, the pizzazz. We've got the opening dancers coming out, choreographed by Paula Abdul. This is, and it's still incredibly 80s there's still the big hair the leg warmers this dancing it's all i mean it's fantastically well done but yeah. um it's got it's got that kind of steampunk vibe to it isn't it really it's kind yeah. of but it's the past now you know and um, but the idea that you have this essentially this 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 is part of the criminal justice system and you have this game show yeah. and yeah. when they're being taken there with the security guards you have the the dancers kind of dancing all around them which i thought was really Kind of well done and cleverly done because then that shows you the kind of the interaction between entertainment and and the kind of the state and gets taken to his uh, yeah to his vehicle which he then which then gives tease it up for Richard Dawson to to knock it out of the park. I think that probably is the best line of the film, only in a rerun. Think, yeah, because it's it just shows that they in this moment they're equals. Obviously, Schwarzenegger's still the 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 prisoner and Killian's still the boss. He's still the head honcho. Um, but we do get, and I'm not sure if this was deliberate or not, the bright yellow spandex costumes manufactured by Adidas, fantastically. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, Adidas. Adidas I, mean, I mean, I wonder if they have to pay for that because you're wondering, you know, if you really would Adidas want that kind of exposure? <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, looking at, I'm say, trying to not to date the podcast too much, but um, you know, looking at the football kits for next summer's World Cup and Adidas have clearly gone back to the eighties for their designs. So I wonder if perhaps on the next season of the X Factor people will be wearing something similar with a nice yellow leotard. Oh god. Right, moving on, moving on. Um <laughs> so Richards has arrived in the game zone. So they've got to negotiate four zones, which reminds me very much of the Crystal Maze. <laughs> You've probably got uh, Richard O'Brien sitting outside with his little harmonica. And um, already we can sort of hark back to the the poor areas and the oh, call them the favelas, where the Joe public are outside already betting on the outcome. They're yeah. betting on which stalker is going to come up first, who's going to get the first kill. You know, and this is something that shows no matter how much exploitation there is, no matter how much this is just a game show, it's gladiators for the 21st century. That they're they're trying to make a bit of money off essentially off death. I mean, it's... Well, I, I think what that what that shows is, I mean, the fact that you have this. I mean, in the book it talks about how um, you have Freevee, which is this kind of installed free television that everybody has, and that only recently the Senate of whatever government it is that they're based in or whatever it's called. Uh, recently, only just recently, stopped the law to make it kind of compulsory to watch television in your house. Um, and so, you know, they talk about this kind of corrosive influence in the book about this that this television can turn people into couch potatoes. And I think it was very, very clear with the betting, with the big screens, with the kind of absolute compulsion to watch this was that it, it was it was this is pure bread and circuses you know this is this is gladiators this is football this is something to divert people from the issues of the day which are you know it's crushing uh, inequality crushing poverty um you know a lack of even the most basic rights you know you talk that you know when when he ends up in amber's apartment he finds a box of tapes which are kind of censored and censored clothing even you know he yeah. mentions but you can tell this is a very restrictive society, but you know uh, you see that this is this is some something that is a distraction from the kind of yeah, and that's one of the reasons and Killian mentions this over and over again, you know they can't have it both ways, you know they can't have me here um putting these guys making this show and at the same time telling me who I can and can't have he's like he's having this relationship with the with the government and the justice department about about how he does this show because for them the reason they're involved in it it serves a political purpose um and that's that is interesting because 
you know, how far does television, how far does that thinking come into it when, I mean, if you think of reality TV shows, I saw an interview once about, um, uh, God, what was it? It was the one about Australian customs police, mm. you know, uh, and it's awful because you go to, you go to Australia, you get searched. I mean, people are pretty bad. I mean, they're very, very strict about kind of any organic matter getting in because they have this very unique ecosystem. Yeah. Um, and so they have this kind of, television channel that's on kind of bravo does bravo even exist anymore actually um, I mean, no, I they, they, they still show that program actually uh, is Oz, Oz you know, control or something like that yeah it's something like that but you know and and they have the cameras in to show uh people don't come to australia with these things you know that's it you know you come and if you think about why they have i saw an episode on the history channel yesterday of chapo you know of the, of the the documentary about chapo being caught yeah. and then escaping and being caught again you know, and the reason why the FBI and everybody's involved in that is say, look, this is what happens if you get involved in drugs, you will get caught. So they saw it as a kind of way of giving PR to a, a, a wider message of, of, of enforcement. And, uh, you know, I found this at the same themes, you know, in this film. But say but one of the, going back to the opening crawl, the, the second paragraph opens with television is controlled by the state. It's again, we're sort of going back to state broadcasters, but also governments using the TV as a tool for their own agenda. And yet, Killian still is concerned about ratings. You know, ultimately, no matter how successful the show is, he judges it on ratings and up against whatever else is on. And there's the one of the very small adverts they showed was climbing for dollars. Well, climbing for dollars is, the, is I'd love to. It's a game show. Where I think I think they should they should bring it in. But instead of having, you know, they should bring, like turn it into a Japanese game show. Instead of having like barking dogs, have like kind of have, like greased up robots <laughs> trying to drag you down. You know, like you know, everybody wears pink. You know, I think that, that you could you could definitely retrofit that. <laughs> the thing is, is, is it does look like one of those shows that Tarrant would have shown in the nineties, saying, "Look how crazy these Japanese guys are." And yet, when you Google the Running Man, yeah, that's the first thing that comes up. Is look what the Japanese are doing now. You know, yeah. Japanese, I mean, sorry, carry no, on. No, so um, you said you, Google, you Google, Google Google the Running Man, and it comes up with this sort of current Japanese TV sh- game show called The Running Man and you think again this is very similar to Robocop where they had the, the joke adverts in the background for in Robocop they had Nukem the game show and things like that um, and this one you know again climbing for dollars it's basically a guy climbing up a rope said, trying to get away from what, four Dobermans or Rottweilers and basically grabbing wads of cash and then ultimately you think he's got away with it Oh no! Just this gas vent comes out and shoots him off, and it just sort of goes to show that this is the caliber of show that's on TV, and it's a lot better than what's on ninety nine percent of TV right now. Yeah, I think we should definitely bring the Running Man into into reality. I mean, we could do we could. I mean, what was the, there was a very similar show uh, film? I can't think of it. It was about ten years ago. Um, and it was seen as kind of an American mate remake of Battle Royale. Which is another kind of Running Man influenced film, which is the Japanese film, which is incredibly uh, a, a kind of cult film as well. So the tentacles of this film, I think, and the book, uh, you know, are found far and wide. Yeah, and you know, we we've got into the game, so we're into the first sort of zone, as it were, and it's essentially a large ice hockey rink. Now, it's not the sort of sort of general scenario getting a game show but we go back to the audience and yeah, this is it it's still a live tv show where an old lady decides on which person is they're going to send to kill um the the contestant it's again sort of showing that satire again about how would you like you know who do you want as the next person and so she chooses sub-zero and he is a very large japanese guy with uh basically an ice hockey stick that doubles as a sword flying around. And he doesn't last particularly long. He puts, uh, what's the, the weedy guy? It's Weiss, isn't it? So he puts him into the goal, the ice hockey goal that shuts it in. But um, Schwarzenegger manages to grot him with the safety wire around the top. And again, quite a, a bloody scene. And 
he manages to lose his fingers as well as part of trying to trying to save himself and when we cut back to the studio it's like it is very it's a, you know the morose where you know one of the main contestants has died but this is even though it's not happened before they say they're still carrying on this is still like this is live tv what you're gonna do you know for me the probably the point the plot point i think that kind of changes things you know um when i mean the game show is a representation of the of the, whatever fascist mm. regime it is and where it changes and where public opinion changes is when the people who are asked because you have the first person who chooses and then she chooses the woman's yeah. very excited and she chooses the sub-zero um and then after that uh you have a couple more and then you have that the, the really glamorous old lady in her kind of 70s and she's asked to choose and she chooses ben richards and then it was like whoa you're not you can't choose ben richards, ben richards um you know, he's, he's, he's not a stalker, you know, and they're like, well, I, I get to choose who I want and I choose Ben Richards. And then you, you cut to the, to the kind of outside in kind of the, in the slums where they have the big screen and the people are betting with that big, big kind of chalkboard. And the guy comes up and says, you know, like hundred dollars on Ben Richards. And they put up for a hundred, hundred to one. Uh, and I was always wondering later when they could have faked the, the death of Ben Richards, yeah. if they paid out on that bet or not, you know, and later on when they find out he's not dead, whether they have to give him a refund. But I, I guess those systems aren't in place to, for the customer in a dystopic. You can imagine Paddy <laughs> Shower doing something like that now, sort of welching on their bet or something like that. It's uh, all, all for the retweets. Yeah, as, as well as losing Sub-Zero to the other characters. And, and these aren't athletes you know, by, by any means. You've got, Buzzsaw and Dynamo. Now, Buzzsaw is a redneck with a chainsaw fetish. And Dynamo is a very large opera singing guy with LED lights like a Christmas tree and can shoot electric bolts. And I was very wary about this because he looks an awful lot like Al Murray. He looks like Al Murray if Al Murray had been taking heroin all his life and then gave up heroin and ballooned in weight. That's, that's, That's what... That's what he looks like. I mean, it, it, also these two are. When I, you know, you watch the film back, you wonder how bad must have these yeah. contestants have been. I mean, um, at least Buzzsaw had a, a chainsaw, and his death, by the way, is oh, yeah. the most satisfying. Literally, a chainsaw up into your balls, and you see the whole kind of vibration, the blood spilling up. His belt buckle cut in half as well. Oh yeah, you see that a bit later on, you know. Um, but then, you know, it, it, it's. Uh, not the end of Dynamo, you know, because he then makes a kind of, he kind of disappears and comes back to basically try and rape Amber, um, who then, you know, somehow puts the kind of sprinkler system on and he gets electrocuted to death. So these two, these two characters are just like the fillers that get killed along the way. Um, Before, but I mean, I mean, we have to mention Yafit Koto, who's, who's, of course, you know, he's, he's in it for half this film and, um, you know, this this is the guy who I I would say, along with Harry Dean Stanton, is like you know, other than Sigourney Weaver in Alien, is the you know you just can't take his eyes off him in that film, among many others. But here he is in a kind of later role, who who actually does does get killed by Buzzsaw. He does, yeah. He's, he cops um, so comes to his room, and um, you also see that you know because I mean Yafit Koto was in one of my favourite TV shows, um, Homicide. Uh, it was early 90s I think it was the precursor to The Wire and yet in this he's he's that sort of cross, he's a resistance chap but he's still you know, it's a bit of a cross, you know, he's a mix between Weiss who's a computer nerd who keeps trying to hack into various networks and but he's still tough enough to, to last a bit longer in the game but yeah, yeah he's, he's sort of in it quite a lot but he's um, you know, it's only after his character Laughlin dies that Killian appears on this private screen in the game zone. It's just after one of, one of the stalkers dies and Killian decides, you know, off air, right, how can we make Richards, he's obviously killing off our, our main yeah. stars. We, we need to get him involved. It's almost like uh, turning the, the bad guy into a goodie, something like a WWE well, it, wrestling. It showed how uh, morally vacu- uh, vacuous the entire, you know, society game show. I mean, if you haven't worked out by then, this is it. I mean, you can, 
you know, one day is almost Orwellian. One day is what, what your enemy is, is, is now your ally, you know, and you could see the crowd turning or something about uh, Ben Richards that had the charisma that he mentioned, the charisma. And so it, it turns um, and he gets offered this after, yeah, Laughlin is, is killed and said, you know, you get the beachfront villa, you get a line of credit, a cadre cola. Um, and uh, and then he, he rips off the camera and says, "I'm going to stuff this down your neck and rip out your spine," which was, you know, there, it wasn't a, it wasn't a line. It seemed like he really meant it. And so that was uh, really that's 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 the change in pace of the film. That's when it it turns into something else, which is then a kind of resistance uh, revolution film. Up to then, it's just yeah, because um, Amber and Weiss have gone off on their own little side plot. They're trying to. You know, and again, this is something that, while it feels a little bit shoehorned in, it's actually the, the main cusp of the final act of the film where they're trying to get access to the network satellite, which is secreted within one of the zones of the game because it's a, a pretty much a no-go area. Um, so they go off and she somehow remembers this really elaborate code to hack into the system. <laughs> and um, and uh, this is the time when, because we've had the occasional cut scene where the footage goes into well, it's in the VIP lounge of the studio where the yuppies and the, the great and the good and the celebrities all sitting there watching the game. And what, what's, there's some fantastic haircuts. And this is something that oh. I love about 80s films is that, you know, there is a kind of acceptance that there are bald people in your society. And so, uh, and this is an issue close to my heart. And, um, you know, and so you have, if you think of Clarence Bodiger in Robocop, you, or um, Richter from Total Recall, you know, these guys, you know, they could be mean guys, but they were they were bald guys, you know, and they weren't just bald guys, they were bald guys that kind of like, they weren't balding well, they were kind of guys who had, you know, they were really struggling with it, and were obviously like cutting the hair in a certain way to pretend it wasn't happening, <laughs> yet they could still be kind of real bad guys uh, in these films, and that, I think that's something that Hollywood uh, has lost now, like everybody has a, has a transplant or uh, taking those prostate cancer drugs. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, it was, re- it was amazing when you, when you cut to the kind of like these, you know, these really hip guys with their girls and they were just like, I mean, they, they look, they look, they look like a Finnish kind of metal. <laughs> and say, so, you know, the cocaine culture is probably still going on. It was like a sequel to American psycho or something like that. Well, that's, that's something that's kind of, um, mentioned in the book a bit more um and and when i was reading it there is there is something of the philip k dicks about it and of course philip k dick is a guy who's influenced many dystopic science fiction films i mean blade runner total recall being a kind of short story but one of the kind of common themes really is the legalization of drugs you know that that uh, is readily available the, 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 the 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 discrimination against smokers so smoking is is really difficult, but marijuana and other types of drugs are, are, are much more permissive. Um, again, another way of subduing the chemical kosh, you know, on the on the population if the TV doesn't work. Yeah, and, and again, sort of from this VIP area where this guy who you think is is, is he one of the sort of fans turns out that Fireball is the fourth stalker with his, again, hilariously bad grey streak throughout his, his hair. And he is called into wardrobe. And it turns out that he's a sort of all-time star stalker that they've had to bring out of semi-retirement anyway to, to fight Richards. And he's got basically a flamethrower, which again, in the going back to some of the other stalkers and their killing equipment, is quite rudimentary in the grand scheme of things. But he also has a jetpack which makes him immediately cool. He does. And there's some great uh, special effects on him uh, <laughs> with that jetpack. Um, yeah. But I think when he gets into the film, you know, and you clearly think, well, shit's, shit's got real. Yeah. Um, but also this is when we learn that the three characters that are given at the beginning, like you remember them, uh, it's Habib, uh, I can't remember the three, three names, but three, basically you always have to have a contestant that once won the running game yeah. you know, somehow escaped and uh, got their freedom. And so these three names are given at the beginning. And whilst escaping from, um, you know, from Fireball, 
uh, Amber and Ben Richards realised that these three guys that actually didn't escape, they were killed, they found their bodies, and there was no hope of ever escaping. Uh, so it was all absolutely an illusion. What, what, even this this very small element that could might not have been an illusion was an illusion. There was no escaping this this kind of uh, this maze and this hell. Uh, and so from then, you know, you, you, and and the way they they kill him as well was quite good. You know, it, it's quite easily subdued. Yeah, it's it's just... I mean, I'm 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 shocked it took this long for somebody you know the, to have killed these people. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that I would have I would have had a I mean, I, I certainly would have had a, a chance. I reckon with with Dynamo, but uh, again, Fireball. He, like you say, he dies like a bit of a sucker because he has Amber trapped in this very weird. Now, I, I, I'm not into. I don't work in television. I don't know where they store their dead bodies, but I can't imagine it's within a locker room in a game show. But they. So Fireball has Amber cornered in this room and he's very much, you know, ready for the kill. And Schwarzenegger pops up and disconnects his gas line. Yeah. And then throws a flare at him and just says, um, how about a light? Which is very mid-ranking in the terms of all-time great Schwarzenegger one-liners. But, um, yeah, he, he really, after all the sort of furoring and him going in in a pardon the pun, blazer glory, he goes like a sucker. That's a bit of a poor way to go as far as he's concerned. Why wow, you think it was, it was his Achilles heel? I mean, yeah. somebody should have thought about that before. But, you know, it, it, it brings the film to its next, you know, to the conclusion, which is essentially from there, they're caught by the resistance. Yeah. And this is where Mick Fleetwood comes back into the, into the fray. Um you know, and so I've got a lot of time for Mick Fleetwood, especially after watching. I mean, I've watched two episodes of Wise Guys now, which I'm, I'm actually quite enjoying. <laughs> um, so I'm on, actually, I'm on episode three of this. I mean, what's really interesting is that Debbie Harry is terrible in it as well. But I always remembered Videodrome. She was really good in Videodrome. Did you ever watch Videodrome? I actually remember it a long time ago. And, and this was the thing is. Yeah, James Woods plays a kind of like, he's a. Uh, he works at a cable TV satellite company that kind of scans for porn channels and finds this kind of, they don't know where the, the signal's coming from, but it's kind of a snuff, a snuff movie channel that he gets kind of obsessed with. And he gets into this very kind of a destructive sexual relationship with, uh, with Debbie Harry, who remember like puts out like cigars on her breasts. But I remember her being really good at that. And then in this, she's just like, they can't even frame her face properly in the camera. Basic shit like that, but I'm just I'm so impressed with with Mick Fleetwood from from this brain dead English rock star type character who played in Wise Guy to this, which is kind of quite nuanced and quite good, and he has his, his some great lines. And I'm surprised. I mean, I'm surprised the same with uh, when you think of Richard Dawson that he didn't he didn't really do any films after this. I'm surprised that Mick Fleetwood didn't I'm surprised they didn't do more. But yeah, it was and that, you know that's when that's when the film goes downhill for me. That that's when it begins. This kind of like it then becomes a kind of very eighties film in that you could have a guerrilla army taking on this bigger foe, whether it's a kind of Vietnam complex or a Korean War complex or you know Korea uh, Colombian Civil War thing. You know, you know the idea of these kind of like a band of like fifteen kids like taking over a TV station and changing every everybody's mind about things is. It's the one time where I felt it's rooted in their time rather than looking at what they thought would be our time. And let's not forget the head of the gorillas with the red hat was uh, Frank Zappa's boy. It was Frank Zappa's boy, one of his, one of his kids, yeah. It was a Dweez, it wasn't Moon Unit, was it? No. <laughs> um, and as we already sort of covered, this is the part where because, I've got to call him John Matrix there, because Ben Richards has been captured, um, Jesse Ventura, who was the great Captain Freedom, uh, they've tried to bust him out of retirement to come out and fight him and basically dressed him up like some sort of weird Dalek. He refuses to go out and fight him. So rather than go for any of this, and he says, oh, I'm not doing this shit. I used to fight guys like this with my bare hands. So rather than you know, admit any sort of truth or the fact that Richards has bested them and disappeared off the grid. It's the CGI fight where they they use the stunt doubles and it's very good sort of digital matting and things like that. But again, it's a a very weird way of ending the show. 
Well, I think that that is actually the that's a brilliant part of the show mm-hmm. is that okay, so we can't win, but it doesn't matter because you know the house always wins. Yeah. So we'll make the house win regardless. And the idea of this technology changing the outcome is great. And also, I mean, Jesse Ventura, I mean, Captain Freedom, I think, you know, he's, he plays like a very camp character. But uh, it, it, the t- his timing in this is brilliant. It's like when they go to the locker room and he's there doing his kind of, you know, like sports caster role. Yeah. And, he, and he sits down and wants to talk about his past kind of like something about – his past achievements and he gets cut off dead by Killian. And this guy is kind of humiliated at every, even to the point where, um, Schwarzenegger goes to his brother's old apartment, and finds Amber there. And in the background, <laughs> you've got him essentially doing that crazy, like workout, like kind of, uh, Mr. Motivator type <laughs> workout on television. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that's him now. This kind of humiliated ex star who's always going to live off, off his past glories. Um, but eventually falls into line, and, and there's no end to his. He, he's just out there. He, he says, yeah, "I'm not doing this." Uh, throws it off, but he does do it. And they make this fake film, and and that's when they realise they have to do something. The resistance, because you know they're not going to allow them to be dead. Yeah. Uh, they, they know they're going to be in there. And they'll hunt them down with with uh, extreme force and kill them. And then, of course, Mick sorts out the uplink. Uh, to the satellite, and then um, yeah. Well, this is it, and you know their their idea is a you know reasonably well edited clip of Killian sort of shouting yes, yes, and they play the non edited footage of the Bakersfield massacre where um, Amber, because part of how she was captured was she was going through the studio archive of various footage, and you know again a quite very good look forward. They had all this footage on on digital memory cards, so a slightly larger version of a of an SD card. And she has been caught, and, and that's how she gets in the game. But um, she manages to, um, how can I put this delicately, present this card, which she has secreted on her person. Yeah, they, they manage to upload that as well. And when Schwarzenegger says, how did you get that in? She just said, none of your business. Now, I think we can all guess how. I'm um, not going to go into that, but... Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, there are several options. I mean, let's not let's not um, predict where that was hidden. I mean, there there are several options. Um, that's, a, that's a game show in itself. It is, yeah. uh, but you know, they find this footage, and the footage is shown, and we, it's kind of alluded to the fact that the the truth has been out is out now, and they can't they can't hide it, and this this changes things, and so it's a very kind of happy clappy ending. You know, they kiss. Killian's dead. He's he's been fired down the, the the kind of shoot down to the running man game, but there's obviously nobody there to stop him. And there's a bit of anarchy going on, so his his craft explodes in an advertising hoarding of himself. Oh, yeah, of course, with Cardre Cola, you know. So it's uh, it you know it kind of ends in a very unbelievable way, as much as the running man could be considered unbelievable. I mean, all of it is, I suppose. But, you know, mm-hmm. Um, but what for me, what is is great about this film because I mean I don't know where do you think this sits in Schwarzenegger's kind of canon? Where do you think it, you know, I, I, above I think, where and below who? I mean, I, I would honestly say that you know my my top Arnie films would be Terminator, Predator, and uh, I mean I, I won't count Terminator Two because that's nineties and we. That's for the laser disc people. We don't deal with those. Um, but <laughs> it, I, I think Terminator Two is dead to me. Yeah. So if if I do run out of eighties films, I'll go on to that one. I think because it, it again, it's one of these films that it starts and works off such a brilliant idea, and for maybe two thirds of it, it runs really well. It's you know goes from a, a sci fi into a, a more standard Arnie film with the violence and, and so on. As a whole. I, I do have to say that Terminator and Predator are far superior in terms of, I mean, Terminator for, you know, all out sci-fi with, and it's much more of a thriller as well. Um, this seems like, you know, I know this came before Robocop, but it seems like almost that sort of future, but it kind of ran out of steam a little bit towards the end. And, and I feel like it struggled to find a, a proper ending. And I wonder that if it did end on something more satisfactory in some way, then it might be remembered more fondly because 
there are parts of this film that are genuinely brilliant. I think so, and I think it would be remembered in, in terms of like nineteen eighties film. I think The Running Man is third, you know, uh, yeah. because of its ideas, uh, its uh, dialogue. I think is in in a way kind of signposts where Arnie's headed to. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it's written in some ways. It's written really clumsily, but other times it's written really subtly as well. Um, and you know, I just think that I, I can't. I mean, there's been talk, it's been in development hell of the Running Man being remade, mm. and I think the Running Man is being is crying out to be remade in this day and age. Like, I can imagine somebody remaking the Running Man and maybe rewriting the ending a little bit. But I mean, you saw with the Total Recall, it, they, they didn't slavishly follow that, which is a good thing, although it wasn't a particularly good film. Um, and so I, I would love to see a remake of this. Yeah. I think, you know, I mean, it would be, it, you, could, you could almost cast Simon Cowell as the, <laughs> as the character, you know. And, and that's the thing is, you know, with, with Total Recall, like, I believe that they went further back to the book as a source rather than the film. And, and they, yeah. they, they remade from there. And you wonder if they did something similar now. But as you say, you know, one, one of the questions I normally ask the guests is if this film were made or remade today, who would be cast and so many people who you think would be perfect candidates whether they could pull it off or not I don't know but you know being that absolutely you have The Rock The Rock would be oh, yes. The Rock would be the money man he, he, The Rock would be Ben Richards I think I think that would be spot on it's it's just that sort of thing where you know and, and The Rock you know would, would never say he's perhaps the best actor but he can pull off that combination of action and comedy and yeah, yeah and, and again and even opposite a good villain, for want of a better word, you know, someone he could have a bit of a bit of that bounce off with. And if it Simon Cowell or, or Les Dennis or someone probably more Les Dennis. I want Les Dennis and The Rock in the remake of The Running Man. I'm gonna go try and find some money somewhere <laughs> and raise some funds in, in Hollywood and I'll be back to you next year we'll with some news on this we'll this incredible film oh, we're gonna put together. Yeah. And, and one of the things I did before we recorded was I put a Twitter poll on as um, if uh, we were making a UK version of the Running Man now, who would be the host? And uh, the winner was Michael Barrymore. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> in a way, you can see that more because Simon Cowell doesn't. I mean, you've, you've got to think of it uh, in relative terms. Like when. Uh, you know, Killian, when when uh, Richard Dawson was originally cast for this role, like it was just what, like yeah. you play this, uh, yeah, you play a game show host, but you're playing such a bastardized version of it. You're such a clean cut character that it would be like uh, having, um, you know, uh, Simon Cowell type character. Whereas Barrymore has had his issues, he's had court cases. I mean, even now that that. Uh, the, the horrible story of what happened at his apartment, his house in Essex with the guy who died is, and, you know, even now the tabloids can't let it go and he's never really recovered from that. You know, he's, he was clearly kind of a tortured guy struggling with sexuality, struggling with kind of uh, boozing, all this kind of stuff. You could see him playing that role very well. Your your followers are very smart because I would replace straight away Simon Cowell <laughs> with... Uh, with Michael Barrymore, I think he'd be incredible, and he would do it. Yeah, and I think he'd do it quite cheaply as well. Minimum wage. And the problem is, and I'm finding yet another pattern is that I made a reference to Barrymore in the Commando podcast, which I decided to cut for probably legal reasons. Um, <laughs> you see, I'm 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 well aware of those. So I don't think you have to cut any of those comments mm. for legal reasons. But I mean, of course. Feel free. Yeah, I've had to declare this podcast as part of my vetting for work, so uh, yeah, maybe it's for the best. But um, as I say we, we've got to the end of the film, and Schwarzenegger's swadding off into the uh, sunset with his his lovely lady. Uh, Killian's gone off. Sven, the bodyguard, decided he looked at one look at Ben Richards, what sod this? I'm going off and pump some steroids into his deaf ears, and that's it. It's um, again, like like you say, it's perhaps the ending unsatisfactory, but that really was one of the 80s films that we all remember. 
uh, looking at this, I mean, even the soundtrack, this is by the guy who wrote Axel F. Yeah. I mean, what more can you say? 80s, 80s, 80s. Well, it is, it is, it is 80s. It's, you know, it's, there's a nod to the 70s sci fi kind of tradition. There's a nod to the future. Uh, you know, I think it's, I mean, of course, the song at the end is so 80s. I mean, it becomes an 80s yeah. film in the last third. Up till then, you know, I think that that it carries it carries itself up there with any sci-fi film of the era. You know, I mean, maybe not, maybe not Alien. I mean, I suppose you had Aliens uh, the year before and potentially Blade Runner. But if they found a better ending, I think Blade, I think Running Man would be considered in in that kind of in that kind of company. I think, so. I think you know, in, in a very kind of pop culture way, in the in the same way that kind of Starship Troopers. People are going back to Starship Troopers now, another Verhoeven film, and realizing that this is a, a, a you know, a, a caricature. This is a kind of piss take of, of it's a pastiche of war. You know, this is this is this, at first when it came out, it was like, oh, this is kind of a you know U.S. style shoot 'em up, and it wasn't. It was the exact opposite. It was taking the piss out of that. It was taking the piss out of kind of war mongering. And um, people look back at that and and re- have reevaluated that because that is again a fantastic film, and I think. If there was, if there had been a more satisfactory, less saccharine shit ending to this film, then it really would would be up there as one of Arnie's best, and would have been considered, I think, one of the best sci-fi films of the eighties. One of them, at least, top yeah. ten, let's say. I mean, as to say, it's got some stiff competition, but I think the first two thirds of this really do hold their own amongst the best of them. Um, and, and say it's yeah. one of those things. That it, the release of it got held back so far so that Predator would have a, a clear run. And, you know, Predator, while effectively a much more simple premise, it was executed because there was the element of the thriller side of it, which I think, um, you know, a lot of the films of the era, I mean, Alien was the the, the prime example. And unfortunately, the, the two happened to meet what, 10, 10 odd years ago. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm my kind of number one if i if i had to choose a kind of uh, kind of franchise to use a terrible <laughs> fucking word uh would be the aliens films because i've kind of i loved um there wasn't really kind of franchise element to short yeah. apart from terminator kind of some conan films so i wasn't really into conan uh alien was you know a great film but aliens was the yeah. film that really did it for, you know I, I i and what they have done since with Covenant, uh, I mean, uh, you know, Prometheus, uh, Alien 4. I mean, I'm trying to find at the moment Alien 3, the assembly cut, which is done from David Fincher's notes, which apparently is very good, much better than the original, although I quite like the original. But it's almost comparable to 1 and 2 now compared to everything they've done since, one of which is Alien vs. Predator, the first one, which I thought was terrible when I watched it. I went to the cinema, I was so disappointed. And then I watched Alien vs. Predator 2, which I think (laughs) may well be the worst film I've ever seen. I mean, just... Actually, I think there's only two films that I've walked out of the cinema of. Alien vs. Predator 2. It was was difficult to find a cinema that was showing it. Um, And The Mexican with... Jennifer Aniston and and uh, Brad Pitt, you know, they were they were a couple. I mean, I we um, had to leave. I mean, the first film I ever saw at the cinema was a, a Legend with Tom Cruise, and we had to leave that because my brother, who was two at the time, saw the devil bloat and screamed his head off. Quite why my mum took us to see that, and I was. Uh, I loved Legend. I thought Legend was. I remember watching that on. on for some reason, BBC Two. I remember would show um, quite. Kind of edgy films at like six o'clock in the afternoon, uh, six o'clock in the evening. So it'd be after Neighbours. You turn on to BBC Two, and there was one. I remember there was there was a Legend I watched the first time it was on then. I must have been eleven. And uh, the next week they had uh, there was a sci-fi film. I cannot remember the name of it, but a guy in New Zealand wakes up and everybody on Earth has disappeared. Uh, and I have to find out. It, it's apparently a famous film in New Zealand. Um, and he finds three survivors eventually mm. after go- this kind of opening sequence where he's walking around going s- kind of slightly mad and about half an hour in he's wearing a woman's dress trying to kick a uh, rugby ball over some rugby posts and then meets up with some, a few people and it turns out that the three of them have all shared they were dying at the moment that whatever happened happened uh, where everybody was kind of taken off earth. And so one of them was being murdered, one of them was committing suicide, one of them had a heart attack, I think. 
and they all survive. And they're the only reason why they survive. So I remember BBC Two, six o'clock in the nineteen kind of late eighties, early nineties, was just an absolute mine of great fantasy and uh, sci-fi film. I really that sounds really good. I really want to see that. Yeah, it was. I mean, I think it was pretty low budget. So what would be impressive now probably look terrible then. Yeah. But um, let me. I'll have to have a look for that. That would be a big change from uh, what they normally show, eggheads or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is. <laughs> well, um, James, as I say, uh, thank you very much for joining us on the show. Um, your latest book has been out a couple of months now. It's the uh, the Billionaires Club. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, Billionaires Club is about. Um, well, it's not about Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, it's a little bit about a dystopic future, I think, that we're heading towards via football, which is the, the kind of story of the super rich. And uh, how how they've got involved in football, and why they've got involved in football, and um, it's kind of told from the perspective of because I knew I wouldn't get to speak to any of them because none of these people ever speak to mm. the press, but speak to the people kind of who've lost out as they've kind of earned their money, uh, you know, earned their fortunes. So it goes to Ukraine, the UK, London, looking at kind of Russian money, uh, Bangladesh, the Middle East, uh, China, the US. Um, and so, yeah, it kind of, uh, I always think, I, I, you know, often think when I look at the running man, I often think of Stan Kroenke. Yeah. But Stan Kroenke is kind of, kind of majority Arsenal shareholder, Los Angeles Rams owner. Uh, I imagine he'd be front and centre of any kind of entertainment kind of running man. He'd be a silent partner in the running man corporation. Yeah, and I, I think imagine. for my Arsenal supporting friends, they'd quite happily see him thrown into an advertising hoarding at the end. Uh, him and his deer hunting... <laughs> buddies and things like that awesome. but um yeah what's well, like <laughs> and um i so say your your book 31 nil was an absolute favorite of mine and um i say they're going all around uh, american samoa and the story of some of the minnows of world cup qualifying was uh again something that we saw in hollywood a little bit later on didn't we was it next goal wins yeah it was yeah i mean uh, you know 31 nil was obviously named after the the, the world record uh, score, 31 nil American Samoa lost to Australia in 2001 in a World Cup qualifier. And uh, when I decided to write a book about the Minnows, I always thought, like, yeah, I've got to call it 31 nil. And if I was going to call it 31 nil, I'm going to have to go to uh, Samoa or American Samoa, uh, wherever they're playing the next World Cup qualifier. And I went expecting, you know, them to lose every game. And I turned up and there's a film crew there that were filming them and, uh, I mean, very, it wasn't, uh, it was just a documentary film crew, so it was very much kind of, they were there at every step of the way, but they were kind of, you know, they weren't uh, in, inserting mm. themselves into anything. Um, and so we just watched this incredible, almost, you know, you can imagine, obviously lots of editing went into that film, but, and you can see me in some of the, yeah. um, in some of the shots, because <laughs> they must have been cursing themselves in some ways. that I, I was there to ruin them uh, in the background, you can see me. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this, this, they, you know, they win their first ever game. They've got a transgender centre back. They've got this kind of incredibly charismatic, very gruff chain smoking coach from Holland who's there to knock them into shape. And they've got the goalkeeper there who, who conceded 31 goals back in the day and it's ruined his life. And they, it's a redemption story. And it's just, it is, and it, it, it is beautiful. And I can tell you from when you watch that film and they almost, almost yeah. make it, but they fall at the final hurdle. Uh, that is exactly how how it went. It was exactly how it went down. It was it was like watching a Hollywood film. How it went, and uh, I'll never I'll never forget it as long as I live. And so next goal wins. I would say everybody should watch. And I've just found it. The New Zealand film I'm talking about is called The Quiet Earth. I'm going to look for that tonight. Superb. Well, say so, James, thank you very much for joining us. As a farewell, as usual, I'll be playing us out with the number one song from the UK at the time of the film's release. And it wasn't released until September 1988, but it's He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother by The Hollies. Have a good one. <laughs>